On this Tuesday night, the earth opens in Iceland. The rivers of lava and the potential threat the volcano poses. Canada's Prime Minister on the threat of terrorism. The rise of anti-Semitism is terrifying. A global news one-on-one -on -one with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Canada puts the brakes on gas-powered vehicles, when they'll be phased out, and what's driving concerns. And our version of Supermarket Sweep, the holiday meal edition. Three correspondents in three cities. Okay, so we need turkey. Who bought the most affordable holiday meal? Global National with Donna Friesen. The force of nature is on full display in the land of fire and ice. After so much intrigue about a volcano that had been rumbling beneath southwest Iceland for weeks, the earth opened overnight, a massive fiery fissure unleashing rivers of lava. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The volcanic eruption is more captivating than it is threatening. It's happening about 40 kilometers from Iceland's capital. As Redmond Shannon reports, the lava flow and the potentially toxic gases are being closely monitored. On the darkest week of the year, a light show like no other. Lava fountains 100 meters high. For tourists, the ultimate Icelandic spectacle. It's just like something from a movie. For residents, the beauty is mixed with foreboding. It's still amazing to see, but kind of a bittersweet feeling. In November, thousands of earthquakes opened up cracks in the earth in this part of Iceland. Authorities evacuated a town. This week, there had been talk it might be safe to return. The famous Blue Lagoon geothermal spa even reopened. We were actually thinking, wow, maybe we, we will be able to have Christmas and uh, New Year's Eve at home. That dream now dashed. The lava fissure measures about four kilometres long, one end just three kilometres from the evacuated town of Grindavik. Even closer, a power plant and the Blue Lagoon. There is a potential threat to all of those things. Uh, we can't rule them out, but it's quite unlikely at this stage. That's because of where the lava is flowing and the walls recently built by the government to protect the power plant and Grindavik. The eruption steadily weakened on Tuesday, but Professor Thor Thordarson says there's no guarantee it will end soon. It might balance out or level out at a, sort of a low level, 10 cubic meters per second or something like that. And if it levels out, then it can actually remain active for weeks to months. Experts say this eruption is very unlikely to trigger an ash cloud similar to the 2010 event that caused aviation chaos. And it is hoped winds will move any volcanic acid rain away from towns. Just another day in the life of the land of fire and ice. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. The force of the earth has been frightening in China. A 6.2 magnitude quake struck northwestern China late Monday. More than 120 people have been killed. The strong shallow quake took down buildings, damaged roads and triggered landslides. More than 700 people have been injured and there have been at least nine powerful aftershocks. Many people spent the night in makeshift camps in the cold. Temperatures dipping to minus 13 Celsius. This is China's deadliest quake in nearly a decade. Tens of thousands of people have been left in the dark after strong winds and heavy rain lashed parts of Atlantic Canada. Severe weather knocked down trees and power lines across the Atlantic region, cutting off power to over 173,000 customers during the height of the storm. Wind speeds reached over 100 kilometers per hour in some areas, including parts of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and western Newfoundland. It's the second time in a week damaging gusts have pulled down power lines across the region. The Supreme Court in the state of Colorado has ruled former President Donald Trump is ineligible to hold office again and will be removed from the ballot for the presidential primary in that state. The stunning decision raises doubts about whether he can remain in the campaign. The court relied on a rarely used provision that bars elected officials from holding office if they have engaged in insurrection or rebellion. Trump's team immediately said he will appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, calling the decision deeply undemocratic. Colorado officials say the issue must be settled by January 5th, the deadline for printing its primary ballots. UNICEF says Gaza is by far the most dangerous place in the world. 
to be a child. Al Nasser Hospital is the largest fully functioning hospital remaining in Gaza. It's also sheltering civilians. UNICEF says it's been hit by Israeli bombardment twice in the last 48 hours. Those Israeli family members of people killed by Hamas on October 7th at a music festival in southern Israel went back to that site today to honor their loved ones. At least 364 people were killed. Dozens of others were taken hostage when Hamas fighters raided that festival just after dawn. Nearly 12 weeks have now passed and the grief is still raw. The father of one of the victims says he wanted to see where his son died. My life stopped at the 7 of October and uh, there is no, no one day that you don't think of him. That attack led to Israel's siege on Gaza and the killing of more than 20,000 Palestinians. Today, a UN Security Council vote on a resolution calling for a sustainable cessation in hostilities was delayed again because of disagreement over words. Crystal Gamansing explains. A prolonged discussion teetering on an impasse. A new resolution was put before the UN Security Council calling for a suspension of hostilities in Gaza on humanitarian grounds. As the U.S. continues to hold things up through a battle of words, bodies shrouded in white sheets continue to be a sight in Rafa. Since we came this morning, we have been revealing people from 6 a.m., we revealed two of their bodies. At least 10 are believed to be under the rubble. As machines and workers dig, more tragic discoveries are made in this southern Gaza city where millions were told to go for their own safety. Israel says it's hit more than 22,000 targets since the start of the war, and a slowdown does not appear to be in the plans. According to a report in the Times of Israel quoting the defense minister, the fighting is set to expand to additional areas of the Gaza Strip. I'm furious. I'm furious that those with power shrug as the humanitarian nightmares un unleashed on a million children. James Elder from UNICEF says the fighting must stop and is calling on world leaders to do their jobs and ensure the protection of innocent lives. Israel claims it is working to protect civilians and released a series of videos highlighting strikes that were aborted because children and civilians were identified. The prime minister, meanwhile, met with wounded soldiers and citizens from the October 7th attacks, as well as some families of hostages. There is anger over Israeli soldiers killing three of their own by mistake while they were holding white flags. You murdered my son twice. You let the Hamas take my son on October 7th, and you killed my son on December, December 14th. More than 100 Israeli captives are believed to still be in Gaza. Israel's president says they are willing to reopen negotiations. Hamas's leadership says first, the bombardments must stop. Crystal Gamansin, Global News. London. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has made it clear he believes Israel has the right to defend itself. He sat down for a year-end interview with our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson today. They discussed the Israel-Hamas war, his leadership and national security. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is deeply worried about the terrorist threat to Canada from neo-Nazi and ISIS-like terror groups. The Prime Minister addressed a story first broken by Global News about an Ottawa high school student charged with terrorism and possession of an explosive substance with the intent to harm the Jewish community. The Prime Minister says the threat of terrorism from groups seeking to radicalize young Canadians is, quote, very, very serious. What we're seeing particularly right now uh, with the rise of anti-Semitism uh, linked to uh, what's happening overseas right now is terrifying and it is something that we absolutely have to act on and we are acting on. We, the arrest on the weekend was an extremely important moment uh, where we're demonstrating that we're doing everything we can to keep uh, the Jewish community in this country safe and we'll continue to keep all communities safe in this country. 
I also asked the Prime Minister about the pro-Palestinian protests that have recently been taking place outside some businesses and in some malls across the country. The video from those protests has gone viral and it is controversial. Protesting and sharing the legitimate aspirations for the Palestinian people, absolutely knock yourself out. We should be doing that and free to do that everywhere and anywhere. But the specifically making other Canadians feel unsafe, whether it's um, Jewish kids on campus, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's you know families wanting to celebrate Christmas with their kids at a photo booth uh, and made to feel guilty because uh, the horrific fact that there are kids dying overseas uh, in Gaza uh, is is something that 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 people can be made aware of, but the aggressive and the underlying violence in um, making other people feel unsafe in this country isn't part of free protesting, of freedom of speech or, or lawful protest. I think the police need to make sure that they are uh, arresting people who are engaged in acts of violence uh, and who are breaking the law, whether it's a, a sound ordinance or, or uh, a uh, trespassing. Um, these are things that we do have to take seriously because they snowball. Finally, if you're wondering if those poor polling numbers have the Prime Minister rethinking his political future, he's not. Justin Trudeau told me that he's not giving up on Canada and that he plans to double down on leading the country into the next election. Donna? Okay, Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thanks. And you can see the full interview with the Prime Minister on a special edition of the West Block this Sunday, December 24th. It will air again on Global on Christmas Day. The federal government has unveiled its roadmap to phase out the sale of gas and diesel passenger vehicles. After 2035, you won't be able to buy new ones anymore. The regulations will require automakers to sell 20% zero emission cars by 2026, 60% by 2030, and 100% by 2035. As Abigail Beeman reports, it is a big shift, and some are concerned about affordability and a shortage of electricity. All new cars, no emissions by 2035. To ensure we don't get left behind and that we keep driving towards the opportunities being created. And more people are driving electric. According to Statistics Canada, in the third quarter of this year, the percentage of electric vehicles registered jumped to 12.1. British Columbia and Quebec drive the most, already meeting the 2026 goal of 20%. There are real challenges to electrification, including affordability and charging infrastructure. The auto industry questions how realistic the plan is with so far to go on infrastructure and cost and uncertainty around available and affordable electricity. Charging at home is a challenge for a lot of people that live in multifamily settings. The government suggests it's working on all of it with a ramp up of charging infrastructure and claims EVs will have price parity with traditional cars within a decade currently there's still a large upfront cost difference and not everyone is ready to plug in and I don't uh, completely trust them yet I could be okay with that like if I can afford it I like my car I'm good Canada's Electric Vehicle Society calls the announcement a step in the right direction and while acknowledging the same concerns believes industry private sector and government need to work together for a fix these rural highways where there isn't infrastructure there's grid issues capacity issues um, and just cost issues, right? Like, you know, running cables to the side of a highway in the middle of nowhere is expensive. The new regulations have a credit and deficit program for automakers who will have three years to reverse deficits if they don't meet targets. The environment minister says after that point, companies will be fined. Industry is concerned penalties will end up punishing Canadians with a shortage of gas-powered vehicles before they're ready or can afford to go electric. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Canada's population is growing by record amounts. Statistics Canada says total population growth over the first nine months of this year surpassed the total growth in any other full year. Canada's population was estimated at just over 40.5 million people on October 1st. That's an increase of over 430,000 people during this year's third quarter, which is the fastest pace of growth in any quarter since 1957. Stats Can says the growth is being fueled by immigration, especially the increase in non-permanent residents.
In Winnipeg, a 17-year-old boy has been charged with second-degree murder in the stabbing death of a 14-year-old girl. It happened near a busy bus stop in downtown Winnipeg last Friday afternoon. Police say the girl was with three people she knew when an argument broke out. One person pulled out a knife. Police say the girl was stabbed multiple times. The suspect was arrested yesterday. The hunt for the best deal on a holiday meal. Our correspondents have a shopping list and have checked it twice. Coming up, who saved the most money? The holiday season can drain bank accounts, especially with the cost of some things on the rise. But there is a bit of good news. Canada's annual inflation rate was unchanged in November. It held steady at 3.1 percent. Stats Canada says consumers paid more for recreation and clothing, but food prices increased at a slower pace compared with October. Groceries still take a big bite out of your finances, though, so we gave three of our reporters in three Canadian cities a special assignment. Go out and shop for the most affordable fixings for a holiday meal. Hi, I'm Heidi Petrachik in Halifax, and I'm about to go shopping for my holiday dinner. So let's see how we do. I feel like I should get the big thing first. I start with the most expensive item, one 5.5 kilogram frozen turkey, 30 bucks. You, you need bread to stuff that bird and dinner rolls too. Then spices, essential but expensive. If you're in Atlanta, Canada, you need savory for your stuffing. That wasn't bad, but time was 3.29. A two pound bag of potatoes, parsnips and carrots and a two dollar onion. Then off to the dairy aisle where my budget had me swapping out one butter for another. I'm no baker so... It looks like this one. For dessert apple pie at $7.99. I was going to keep track but, uh, but that kind of didn't happen. <laughs> so now I'm just going to wing it at the chicken. Okay, I'm going to be honest, I think I underbought here in my attempts to be frugal and on budget. My total for all this is $98.25, and I did have to get gas to get my groceries as well, so I spent $30 on that to a total of $128.25 for my grocery shopping trip for the holidays. Hi, I'm Mike Gerlay in Toronto, heading to the Super Centre to shop for a holiday feast. We're looking for good prices, but we're not skimping on quality. Right off the bat, I missed a speed bump. The car. This is one smooth ride. Oh, but it's how you recover, right? And with the camera now set, we found our seven kilo turkey for twenty-two dollars and forty-eight cents. A fancy spin of the potato bag later, and I was on fire. Even though I missed most items on the first pass, I got it done. I found all the veg trimmings as well as coffee and pie for after and made my way to the checkout. So my grand total came out to 97.93. Not a bad dinner for five or six people. And you know what they say, he who shops does not cook. So happy holidays to me and to the local charity where I'm donating this. I'm Heather Urex West in Calgary at $1.79 a liter. Your money in Alberta certainly goes further at the pumps. But what about at the grocery store? To see if I can stretch my money as far as it'll go, let's head back to the office first. Instead of going into a store today, I'm going to shop around first online. I like to use an app called Flip to compare prices. You just type in the item you need, say turkey, and you can see all of the different sale prices. Okay, so we need turkey, potatoes. I have all 17 items ordered, some on sale, so that's always good. Now off to the Walmart parking lot to do a pickup. Got the groceries, now back to the office to see how I did. I saved money on the turkey with a less recognizable brand. It came in at $24. Everything on the list from turkey to pie, and all together I paid $101.53. Donna? All such thrifty shoppers, Heather, thanks. And again, that food isn't going to waste. It's going to be donated to local charities. High flying reinforcements next. Why the Canadian military is buying armed drones.
The Royal Canadian Air Force is buying a fleet of armed Reaper drones. The federal government will spend $2.5 billion on 11 remotely piloted aircraft systems. They're built by the U.S. defense contractor General Atomics. They'll be stationed in Greenwood, Nova Scotia and Comox, B.C. The drones will not routinely carry weapons during operations in Canadian airspace. They'll be used for coastal surveillance as well as military and civilian operations such as responding to fires and floods. Delivery won't happen until 2028. There are reports Ukraine is ramping up its use of so-called vampire drones to hunt down Russian troops. The drones are launched at night. They're fast, hard to detect and designed to carry heavy explosives. Ukraine says they were used this week on the eastern front line and forced Russian soldiers back 15 kilometers. It's not just Paris that's the city of light. Next, how Rome is getting lit. Every neighborhood has that one house that goes a bit nuts with their holiday lights. And when in Rome, the city has strung up something spectacular. 300,000 lights stretching the entire length of the Via del Corso. The display is dedicated to the universal theme of peace, something to strive for in these troubled times. That is Global National for this Tuesday. I'm taking some time off for the holidays. I hope you and your loved ones are able to do the same. On behalf of the entire Global National team, thanks for trusting us to bring you the news every evening. We wish you much peace and joy over the holidays and into 2024 when I'll see you again. Bye-bye.